Go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Talking about war today. You know, wars and conflicts have been a reality of human interaction on this planet since the very beginning. Since Genesis chapter 4. You know, maybe people, as, they, as they've looked back through history, if historians, whoever, sociologists, have tried to understand where do wars come from? Why do we find it so necessary to fight and to kill? One person who thought about this issue was Anne Rand. You may recognize her as the author of the book Atlas Shrugged. She also wrote a fairly well-known article entitled The Roots of War. In that article, Ms. Rand thinks more, le- more in political terms, and she describes the root of war being something she calls statism, which she describes as the tribal premise of primordial savages who, unable to conceive of individual rights, believe that the tribe is supreme and omnipotent ruler that owns the lives of its members and may sacrifice them whenever it pleases to whatever it deems to be its own good. And that these then tribes also look at other tribes as being just their prey, to be conquered, looted, uh, enslaved, annihilated, whatever it is that they may want to do. And she goes on to say that in modern times, statism is seen as a country's political system, seen in a country's political system to the degree to which it breaks up the country into rival gangs and sets men against one another, which sounds fairly familiar. And she writes, further writes, in order to survive under such a system, men have no choice but to fear, hate, and destroy one another. It is a system of underground plotting, of secret conspiracies, of deals, favors, betrayals, and sudden bloody coups. Now, Ms. Rand is not a believer, as far as I know, but she was given common grace by God to have some insight into where war come from. But I'll correct what she says just a little bit, because what she describes as statism is simply the pride and selfishness of the human heart on a grander scale. See, there aren't multiple roots of war. There is one root of war, and that is the sinful human heart. The root of all war, the root of all conflict of any kind between people, comes from the human heart. It comes from our selfishness and our pride. And that's the natural state of every human being. We are driven by self. That is what the world is. But God, on the other hand, calls us to look outside of ourselves. In fact, God calls us to put ourselves last, which goes completely against our natural bent. Because God's way and the world's way are two completely different ways of looking at life and looking at society. And that's kind of been an underlying theme that's been going on through this book of James. This contrast, this conflict between the way of God and the way of the world. James has presented us with several different contrasts as we've gone through this book so far. He talked about the contrast between true faith and false faith. True faith is seen in a changed life, seen in a person who truly believes in Christ with their whole being, and that is then evident through changed attitudes and through the good works that they do. Good works, of course, being Things, not just things like giving to charity that we think of in society, but, but anything that demonstrates love for God and love for uh, your neighbor as yourself. This is what James calls pure religion. And then he does another contrast, pure religion with worthless religion. Pure religion is controlling your tongue. It means being careful about what you say. James says if you don't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. Pure religion, he also says, is caring for the vulnerable, caring for the needy that are around us. And pure religion is keeping oneself unstained by the world. In other words, following God's ways, being obedient to God. And then another contrast that James presented, we actually talked about this last week, was the contrast between wisdom from above versus wisdom from below. And... Wisdom from above comes from God. It's one of his good and perfect gifts. The wisdom from below is limited to what can be known by just limited human reason, limited human observation. Wisdom from above is humble, and it is pure. It is seen in peaceableness, gentleness, it's steadfast, it's genuine. Wisdom from below is full of bitter envy and selfish ambition. The wisdom from above results in peace. 
and righteousness. The wisdom from below results in disorder and every evil practice. And that's then what leads us into our text for today. There's a break between the end of chapter 3 and and beginning of chapter 4. There is a break, but it's also a clear flow of thought. James had been talking about the natural fruit of worldly wisdom being chaos and strife, and now in our text today, he's going to warn us about what kind of conflict and division in the church, uh, what it looks like, and how we need to deal with that. Now, I need to give you a warning before we get into this. If you came here today looking for a feel-good message, or if you like to leave church feeling better than, you know, better about yourself, then I'm sorry, but you're probably going to be disappointed today. James doesn't pull any punches in our text today. He even inflames the rhetoric, if you will, to get our attention. And he's addressing his text today in particular to fence sitters. People who try to straddle the fence between the church and the world, between God's ways and the world's ways. And what we'll see in this text is that fence is pretty rickety. It can't sustain you. You can't straddle the fence. And when someone falls off that fence, they generally fall on the side of the world, not on the side of God. Let's go ahead and, on that happy note, let's go ahead and read what uh, James has to say, and then we'll talk about it in more detail. James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says, The spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Conflict and disunity is a big problem in the church. This is what James is addressing. But if we want to truly understand the conflict, disunity, we need to recognize that the reason for whatever conflict there is in the church is not out there. We don't need to be looking out there for why we're having trouble in here. The trouble is in here. The cause of any strife that we may have in our church is in here among the people and within our own hearts. And that's what we need to deal with. Now, as I said before, there's a a clear flow of thought from the end of chapter 3 into this passage, which actually really goes all the way to verse 12. But there's also a break between chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's noticeable in the way that James addresses his readers. It's noticeable in the tone that he takes, this more severe tone that he starts to use, chapter 4 onwards. And one of the theories that I think seems most likely is that in chapters 1 through 3, James is kind of warming up. He's addressing general issues that could be a problem in any church. In, in, In any church that he might be talking to, these were just kind of general things. And then in chapter 4 on... It seems that he's addressing specific problems that he's heard about in those churches that he's writing to. That he knows that there are a problem there. And this is why he begins to get more pointed and more direct. And this is why his tone starts to get more severe, starts to get more animated in the way he talks. It's kind of like, for example, if you were talking to your child who had, you know, maybe been having a problem in a specific area, maybe not doing their chores or homework on time or whatever. And you might start your dad lecture or your mom lecture, you know, with general things. Like, you know, children just need to obey their parents. That's just, you know, that's a a general thing. And and it's important that you plan your time so you can do all the things that you've been assigned, all the tasks and chores. And then you might begin to get more direct and start to address the specific issue that the child is having. Like, you haven't taken the trash out on time for this last several weeks. We've had to remind you, you haven't done your homework uh, and you've been turning in your assignments late. You need to get your act together, and then you might start to talk about consequences, you know, less TV time, less internet time. That's kind of what's going on with what James is doing. He's gotten through the general stuff, and now he's getting pointed. He's now he's getting direct, and so you need to deal with these issues. 
And this is personal for James because he's not writing to just all churches everywhere. I mean, he does. Obviously, in God's grace, this is given to all churches everywhere. But the people he was writing to were, had been members of his church. They had been in the church in Jerusalem, and they would have been scattered by the persecution. And he's still taking a pastoral, personal interest in their lives. And so it's, this is a dad chat for him. He's, he's, this is personal. He said, I care about what's going on in your lives, and you need to, to shape up. And in this particular text, the ba- the, what he's basically saying is, let me talk to you about the fights that I hear have been going on in your churches. And you need to do something about this. And there's two particular problems that he points out in our text that give rise to these wars and fights that he's talking about. The first one is conflicting passions. The second one is divided affections. Conflicting passions and divided affections are at the root of all of the fights and quarrels in their churches. And they are problems that we face, too, in our churches. So these are things we need to listen to. If there's division, if there's strife in our church that would start to arise, this is where it comes from. Conflicting passions and divided affections. And so we need to listen and be warned and think about how we can prevent this from happening in our own church. So James begins this section of text with a rhetorical question. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Actually, in the Greek, he asked the question twice. From where the wars? From where the fights? And notice, just in the terms that he uses, he's not pulling punches. Notice he doesn't say, where are these little squabbles coming from? He says, where are the wars coming from? Where are the fights? Wars is a, is a word used of nations and armies clashing against one another. I mean, yes, it is also used metaphorically of quarrels and conflicts and stuff that don't include weapons, but it's a strong word. That's what he chooses to use. The word fights could be translated battles. It's generally talking about a, a fight where there's a, one person on each side, like a duel or a gladiator fight or something like that. And James is intentionally using strong words. He's not soft-touching things. He's not being touchy-feely. He's unhappy to hear that there has been this fighting among these congregations, within these congregations that have now spread outside Jerusalem. And, you know, it could have been a lot of reasons, but there's a lot of things that can, that can kind of give the, the, the conditions where fights start. That Maybe it was this, just the stress of having been transplanted to a new location where they were unfamiliar with and, and, and societies and towns where they're not comfortable with the area. Maybe the financial problems because of they just... That was true of the church early on. They had these financial problems. But those may have been the conditions that gave rise to this, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter for us or any other church. If we have authentic faith, if we're operating on the wisdom that comes from God, then fights and quarrels have no place among us, no place within our churches. Rather, we as the church should be showing the fruit of peace and righteousness. And so James asked this rhetorical question, then he answers his own question. He says, I'll tell you where the fights and quarrels are coming from. And the, the, he says, the fights, they're coming from your own internal desires. The word that he actually translates here as, as passions is the same Greek word that we get our word hedonism from. It's those, those passions for, for pleasure uh, desire for comfort, desire for fame or power or riches. That's the kind of thing he's talking about with these passions. And he's saying these desires are at war. And that word war, it's a different one than up in verse 1. It's a specifically military term. If you take the noun verb form of it, it means soldier. They're at war. And this war is happening at a couple different levels. He says within you, but the literal translation would be in or among your members. Okay, members, is that members of our own bodies or that members of the body? Well, it could be either one. It could be understand this wars could be happening within individuals or among the people of the church. It's probably both. Because within individuals, our passions, our desires are at war. The desires of the flesh are at war with the desires of the spirit. It's like what Peter says, 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Paul talks about the same thing in Romans chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. He says, in my inner self, I delight in God's law, 
But I see a different law in the parts of my body, really the members of my body, so there's that word members again, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. So these sinful desires, or you could say the law of sin, as Paul calls it, are waging war against our souls that have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. And then whenever we allow those sinful desires to the desires of the flesh to get the upper hand, what does it result in? It results in sin and disorder um, in relationships. So that's within the individual, but it's not only the conflicting passions within each individual. The verse, like I said, could also be translated as the wars and fights that come from the passions that wage war among you. This is where we see the prevalence of the wisdom from below, from end of chapter 3, that's full of bitter envy and selfish ambition. I mean, when each person is being selfish and prideful and only looking out for their own interests, what do you think happens? Well, each person's selfish interest bumps up against somebody else's selfish interest. They conflict with each other. The punctuation in verse 2 is notoriously difficult to translate properly, and I think the CSB did not make a good choice here. I think the New American Standard renders it better, along with many of the commentaries. It, it says it this way, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. The fighting and wage war comes from you can't covet and can't obtain. You want something, but you can't get it because other people want something different, and they're fighting for what they want. And that causes murder, James says. Now, he's not very unlikely that he's meaning literal physical murder that's going on in the churches that he's writing to. He probably has in mind what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You may remember this, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard it, that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. That's probably what's in James' mind here. In other words, when you get angry at another person such that you demean them with your words or you slander them, that is basically the same thing as murder. It's actually the same motives that are behind it in your heart. We could call it character assassination. You know, when a person tries to make everyone else think less of the target that they're going after. And how do we do that? We do that by spreading rumors, talking behind their back, talking down to them. You know, a couple, I thought of a couple of examples. You know, oh, did you see that car that he drove up in? How much must, how much must that car cost? Oh, and you know their house? It's really expensive, too. They must be flaunting their money. You know, if, if I had that much money, I would be giving it to the church, and I would be giving it to the poor. But the person who's saying that has no idea how that person is using their money. They're, they're probably speaking out of envy because they wish they had that much money, right? That's bitter envy and selfish ambition. Or why are they letting her lead that Bible study? Don't they know that she slept around when she was in college and she even had an abortion? But the person who's saying that has, has making no room for God's grace for how much that person, that woman has suffered through guilt and shame. They don't know how much God has used that in her past to help her grow in maturity and faith, which might make her the perfect person to lead that Bible study. The person is just speaking from a harsh judgmentalism or possibly from jealousy because of the respect that woman gets because she's the leader of a Bible study. In both examples that I gave, the motives behind what the person is saying is what Jesus says is basically the same motives as what's behind murder. Again, James is not sugarcoating things, is he? He wants us to feel the gravity of what it means to have conflict in the church. We fight, we backstab, we quarrel, we slander, all because we don't have what we want. That is pride. I should have what I want because what I want is the most important. Or that is selfishness. I care about my desires. I care about my preferences. I don't care about anybody else's. It's the result of people thinking that their own, that themselves as the center of the universe. You know, and we should expect to see that in the world. 
Of course. I mean, that's going to happen. We should expect to see that in our politics at every level. That is not something that should be seen in the church. And yet it is seen in the church way too often. You know, one person wants upbeat music with drums and electric guitars. Someone else just wants to sing hymns with, with a piano. Some people have different ideas of what color the carpet in the sanctuary should be. Or, you know, it might be more serious. It might be, you know, what ministry should be the highest priority in the church, where the money and the budget should be spent. Those are, those are serious questions. But it, it's not so much that different ideas about some of those things is wrong. It's the problem is how we approach the differences that we have. Now, sometimes desires are wrong in and of themselves, right? So that is true. Those con- create conflict all on their own, like lust for power, like desire to have the most influence in a church, or, or laziness, not wanting to have to put out any effort or do any work. So sometimes desires are wrong just in and of themselves, but many times desires are neutral or even good desires, but when they conflict with somebody else's desires, there's still that possibility for wars and fights. And so James goes on to describe why conflict arises even when our desires are not for wrong things, sometimes. And he gives two reasons. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Number one. Number two, you ask, but you ask from wrong motives. When he says you do not ask, it's interesting because it's an intensive form of the verb, which is kind of like he's saying, you do not really ask. I mean, you might say the words in your prayer kind of a little thing, but you're not really asking. And it also puts it in present tense, which seems to imply you don't continue to ask. Part of really asking is continuing to ask. And so one of the key reasons he's saying that people don't have what they desire is because they don't ask God for it. And yes, we know that God knows what what we need. God knows our needs and our desires, but he also wants us to ask him. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, again from the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, this is not implying that God will grant all our sinful, selfish desires. But actually, when we bring our requests to God in prayer, it often has a purifying effect on our desires, doesn't it? What this verse in Matthew 7 also doesn't mean that God will give us everything we want and ask for. But it does imply that God oftentimes will not give us something until we ask him for it. So asking God for things is important. As we pray in Jesus' name, right, it should make us think about what would glorify Jesus' name. What would Jesus want to have his name attached to? should cause us to think through what would be pleasing to God, God, what would God be happy to grant, and and that we would ask for those things. That's purifying our desires. Asking God also expresses our humility, our dependence on God. And so it's important that we ask, and many times if our desires are being frustrated, it's because we never asked. If we had asked, it it would have resulted in one of two things. Either our desires would have been shaped and reformed through that process of prayer, or our desires would have been met. So many times, if we don't have, because we don't ask. The other reason we don't have is because we ask with wrong motives. Literally translated, it would just say, in the Greek, it just says, you ask wrongly. What does it mean to ask wrongly? Well, one way of asking wrongly is to ask for the wrong things. You know, when Jesus said what he said in Matthew 7, asking you shall receive and all that, he said that in the context of the whole rest of his sermon. So you have to look at the whole context. And you look at back in Matthew 6, this is what shapes asking you shall receive. Matthew 6, 9 and 10, this is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And don't worry about stuff like food and drink and clothing. Rather, chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. 
So all of those things need to be taken into account when you think of ask and you shall receive. Ask with God's glory and God's kingdom in mind. Ask according to God's will. Ask for things that promote the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is asking, asking rightly rather than wrongly. So asking wrongly is asking for wrong things with the wrong focus, but it's also asking even for right things but for wrong reasons. See, if you ask for a good thing, but you ask with wrong motives, it's still asking wrongly. And the verse here says, so that you may spend it on your pleasures, right? Might be actually better to translate it as squander rather than spend, because the word uh, used there is the same word used to the prodigal son who squandered his father's estate. See, there's many places in Scripture where people are actually, actually commended to, for asking God for blessings. We're, we're encouraged to ask God for his blessings. But if we ask God to bless us just out of selfishness, just so that we can satisfy our own desires, then that would be wrong. Just give me, an, give me an example. Like, for example, you might pray that God would help you get that promotion at work, right? Now, in one case, your motive for that might be because you'd like in that kind of more manager or leadership position, you'd have a broader influence for Christ. You'd able, be able to lead from biblical principles. You might desire the additional income so that you can you know, send your child to a Christian college or so you can give more to Christian ministries. If those really are your motives, then that's probably good. That's asking with good motives. That's honoring God. But if you want that promotion just so that you can lord it over your coworkers who used to look down on you, or if you just want the extra money so you can buy more stuff, then that's wrong motives. That's asking wrongly. And God does not honor selfish requests. By the way, this should be an indictment on the health and wealth gospel, the name it and claim it group. That's all about power and wealth. But we shouldn't just point the finger at those people who are doing it wrong. We need to be, take a look at ourselves because many times our requests can be very greedy. We need to think about this. God does not look favorably on self-focused prayers. And when we are selfish like that, that is the root of conflict and disorder in the church. So to, be, to, to make peace, to root out disunity, in the church, we need to deal first with our own selfishness. We also need to deal with pride and divided affections. James begins the next subsection in a way that is guaranteed to get your attention. Again, he's not pulling any punches. You adulterous people. Trigger warning, right? That's not touchy-feely. He's talking about people with divided affections divided between the world and God. The, the word adulterous people is actually in the feminine form, which is why some of your Bibles you might have translated as adulteresses. But James is obviously speaking to the whole congregation. That's why you adulterous people is an appropriate translation. And speaking this way, what he's doing is kind of taking on the mantle of an Old Testament prophet, because there's many Old Testament prophets that spoke exactly this way. Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they all spoke that way. In fact, Jeremiah 3.20 is an example. However, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me, house of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. And it wasn't just Old Testament prophets, by the way, though. Jesus did this as well. He called the people who rejected him as Messiah. He said, you wicked and adulterous generation. And this terminology of adultery is supposed to highlight the people's unfaithfulness to God. He should have our undivided loyalty, undivided affection. You cannot straddle the fence. You have to choose. You can't have both God and the world. And what James is saying here is kind of echoes Jesus' teaching again in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other, you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and the world. You cannot serve both God and anything. When we chase after the things of the world, or when we look to the world for our security, for our comfort, for our well-being, 
what's that like? That's basically like a woman flirting with a man who is not her husband. Maybe even having an affair with him. That's basically what James is pointing out to us. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, by world, James doesn't mean the physically, physical created universe. I mean, we know that that's something God loves too. It's okay for us to be delighted with the beauty of the ocean and with mountains, delighted with flowers and birds. It's okay to be excited and, in a sense, loving the world as long as it's below loving God. By, all, by world, James also doesn't mean just human beings in general. God loves humanity. We're, he made us in his image. It's okay to love humanity as, as, as a whole, even in its fallenness. By world, what James means is that ethos of life that's in opposition to, or at least in disregard of, God and of God's kingdom. It's the system of this world's societies and governments that are just shaking their fists at God. That's what he means by the world. And by friendship, he's not just talking about a casual acquaintance. In James' time, a friend was someone, was, you wouldn't call somebody a friend unless you had a close bond with them. Friendship was thought of as a lifelong pact between people with shared values and shared loyalties. That's what he means by friendship. The friendship with the world is identifying with the fallen world system, identifying with its standards, with its priorities. And since the world's standards and the world's priorities are opposed to God's, that is the same thing as hostility against God. And James, again, is not the only one who says this. The Apostle John says something very similar. 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. Now, James's warning in this passage is not necessarily assuming that the people he's, listen, he's writing to or us that are lit reading this, he's not necessarily assuming that we are renouncing Christ and consciously deciding to follow the world instead of Christ. But what he's saying is that when we discriminate and show favoritism, like he talked about in chapter 2, or when we speak bad about people and that our tongues get out of control, like he talks about in chapter 3, or when we show bitter envy and selfish ambition, like he talks about in in the end of chapter 3, what we're doing in those moments is following the world's priorities. We are trying to curry favor with the world. That's like a married person flirting with someone who is not their spouse. James wants us to realize how high the stakes are in this. Because God doesn't tolerate rivals. But when a believer behaves in a worldly manner, in that moment at least, their allegiance is with the world, not with God. And we need to realize that. And then that sets up what James says next in verses 5 and 6. And as we get into this, I just have to let you know going into it that James 4, 5 is widely known as one of the absolute hardest verses in the entire Bible to interpret and to translate. So just let you know that up front. There are challenges with what's in the, what the exact original text is because some of the manuscripts have some differences. There are challenges with where to put the punctuation. There's challenges with what does he mean by spirit? Is that the spirit of man or is that the Holy Spirit or is that... What does he mean by envy or jealousy? Is it a good desire, bad desire, all these kinds of things? There's also the problem of figuring out what scripture quotation is he talking about in verse 5. Because the, first, the second part of verse 5 doesn't match anything in the Old Testament anywhere. It doesn't match any other Jewish literature. So this verse is a big enough problem that if you're to lay out some of the respected Bible translations that we uh, would even hold, be holding in this church, the CSB, the New American Standard, ESV, uh, NIV, you'd find that they were very different translations, even to the, the sense of what they're saying. Like, for example, our CSB that we're using renders it as the spirit in us is doing the envying, and it's a bad envying, right? In the ESV, in the New American Standard, it's God je- de- jealously desiring the spirit that he's put in us. So the good spirit that he's made put in us, and God doing a 
a good kind of jealously desiring. So I say all that just to let you know that given all these uh, problems, it, we have to be very cautious about making any major point that hinges on a specific interpretation of this verse, right? But all that being said, we can also know the gist of what, where James is going with this by looking at verse 6, which is a direct quotation from the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to spare you all the ins and outs and all the different options of how we could look at this, how we could translate it, and I'll just give you the conclusion that I came to after sifting through all the information that I could find. This conclusion doesn't solve all the problems with this verse, but it, I think it does make the most sense. Uh, so in verse 5, James says, Do you think it is without reason that the Scripture speaks to this effect? So he's not starting the quotation right there. And then he goes on in the end of verse 5, in the first part of verse 6, to sort of paraphrase the verse that he's going to quote in verse 6, the verse from the Old Testament. So he, he kind of paraphrases it, and then he quotes from Proverbs 3.34, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So that the second part of verse 5 parallels the idea that God resists the proud, which would indicate that the New American Standard ESV translation is better than the CSB. God jealously desires the spirit he has made to dwell in us. In other words, God has made us in his image. He has given us a spiritual element to our being, and that spirit is supposed to be turned to God in loyalty and affection. And so God is like a jealous husband. He does jealous in the good way. He doesn't want our affection to be turned to any other lover. And so he goes against, he resists those who are proud, those who would set themselves up as their own God, that, that would turn to some other uh, God. They would think of themselves as the determiner of who the proper place to, to put their affection is. God is, goes against those who are proud. But the wisdom of the world is proud. The common sense of the world is, is self, bitter envy, selfish ambition. So those who are proud who have, have chosen the priorities and the methods of the world, they're the ones who cause disorder, and evil practice. They're the ones who cause wars and fights. But God hates arrogance. This is what he says. He resists the proud. He hates arrogance. He despises pride. He hates those who cause strife and turmoil amongst his people. We know this. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone with a proud heart is what? Detestable to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So God resists the proud, just as it says in, the, in verse 6 in the quoted verse. But on the other hand, those who are humble, those who submit to God's authority, those who depend on God, God gives them grace. This is the greater grace that is mentioned in the beginning of, chapter, of verse 6. And the grace to the humble that's in the second part of Proverbs 3.34. Isaiah 66 is a great example of this that reminds us of God's approval of the humble. It starts off in Isaiah 66, 1, of reminding us of who God is. It says, this is who the Lord is. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where could you possibly build a house for me? And where would my resting place be? My hand made all these things, and so they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. So God is the creator. God is the one who made the world. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Shouldn't we want to know what he expects from us? What kind of person he approves of? Well, here it is. This is the kind of person he approves of. Isaiah 66, 2. I will look favorably on this kind of person. What kind? One who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. That is what he expects from us. That is why he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And the good thing is that God's grace is more than enough for all the requirements he puts on us. It's greater than all of our sinful tendencies. Because yes, God is a consuming fire. And yes, God executes judgment on those who stray away to idols and to other allegiances. But God is also merciful and gracious. He willingly supplies what we need in order to fulfill his commands. And so this verse applies to humility before God, but it also applies to humility toward one another. When he says he gives grace to the humble, what kind of humble? Well, the humble before God and the humble towards other people. 
In fact, Peter quotes this same verse from Proverbs 3.34 in his first letter, 1 Peter 5, and this is the application he directs us to from that verse. He says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So what is humility he's talking about? Humility means we don't insist on our own preferences. It means we don't grasp for power. It means we put other people's needs before our own. That is what promotes peace and unity in the church. God wants there to be peace and unity in his church, doesn't he? We know that. When we are fighting amongst ourselves, we do great damage to the cause of Christ. For one, we present the picture that the gospel has no power. I mean, it doesn't, it, we're showing that it has made no effect in our lives if we're being that way. I mean, the world already fights amongst itself, right? The church needs to be different. Out there, every little tribe, every little group fights against one another. If we do that in the church, we are no different from them, and we misrepresent the Lord and his kingdom. And so we must not do that. So how do we work on this? We need to look to our hearts. That's where the problem is. That's the root of war. In the sinful human heart. Conflicting passions. Do we let the passions of the flesh get the upper hand in our own hearts? That is one of the seeds of discontent. Do we selfishly insist on getting what we want? Do we demand our rights to be met? That's conflicting passions. The church in Corinth was doing that. You read the 1 Corinthians, you see Paul addressing their selfish ambition and bitter envy over and over again. In fact, they were going to the point of suing one another outside in the courts. And Paul said, if you do that, you're already defeated. It's better to let yourself be wronged and cheated than to fight with each other in front of the world. So conflicting passions cause wars and disputes. But so also do divided affections. So when we try to straddle the fence and we try to keep a foot in both the kingdom of the world and in the kingdom of God, that that kind of wavering and double-mindedness causes chaos in our own lives, and it causes chaos in the church. And God detests divided affections. Like he said to the, church in, to the church in Laodicea, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. But God approves of those who are humble before him. Those who are holy devoted to him with their entire being. And the greatest example of all of this is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is who we always must look to. And the great example of this is when Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi was a good and solid church. But even in that church, they had some quarrels and some disputes. And Paul even had to call out two ladies in his letter, Yodia and Syntyche, and say, you need to get along. And these were ladies he called partners in the gospel. They were, they were mature Christians for the most part, but they, for some reason, couldn't get along. And he wrote to the Philippi. Now, I'll just say that here at Carlton Oaks, we are maybe not as great as the church in Philippi, but we have, we've been pretty blessed. We haven't had major strife and chaos and dispute in our church, and, and I thank God for that. But we need to be on our guard, just like the church in Philippi. We're not immune from that. As one of my former pastors said, the seeds of disunity are sown under the surface of every church, just waiting for the right water and the right sunshine conditions to spring up. So we need to be on our guard. And so listen to what Paul's exhortation was to the church in Philippi. This would be his word to us as well, by the way. Philippians 2, starting in verse 1, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Make my joy complete by thinking the same way. That means all of you thinking the same way with each other. Having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but what? In humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. That's how we need to act. And how do we do that? Well, then he goes on. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Our greatest inspiration, our greatest motivation for that is Christ himself. He goes on, verse 5. 
Adopt the same attitude which was in Christ Jesus. What was that attitude? Verse 6, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had, become, when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. That is the example that we are called to follow. Death to our selfish desires and love towards others. We are called to have desires that are shaped by God's word, that are informed by God's spirit, and affections that are completely focused on God himself. And if we do that, by God's grace, we will be able to maintain peace and unity within this church for the glory of God and for the spread of the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Our great God, we confess that we too often are focused on ourselves. We are puffed up with pride. We allow the wisdom of the world to take hold, follow the common sense of the world of bitter envy and selfish ambition. We pray that you would forgive us of this selfishness and pride and that you would help us to keep our eyes on Jesus and follow his example of humility and selflessness. May the May we have the attitude that he had. May we be transformed by the power of your word and your spirit. May we may give glory to him that we may spread the good news, salvation in Christ to the world around us. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.